jazz concert on next door, so I have to finish by eight. <laughs> okay, the topic I wanted to talk upon, on, Phil asked me to give a talk. I wasn't sure what I wanted to talk on, and so I thought I would dive into the deep end and talk about, is quantum mechanics non-local? To a certain extent, this is sort of a silly question. And as you will discover after I finish the talk, that my answer is, in fact, very easy, no. <laughs> so those of you that wanted the pray see it's done, you can leave. Um, so I've given away the, the, the plot. No, I haven't given away the plot. I've given away the uh, denouement of the plot. Uh, the problem is that many people, many, many people, including some people that uh, I would say should know better. Uh, for example, Sandy Popescu gave a talk here about, what was it, a year ago? Two years ago. In the same series in which he constantly talked about the non-locality of quantum mechanics. I took him to task on it, and he sort of mumbled something and then kept doing it. <laughs> So what in the world, so that was just that. And in fact, Einstein is supposed to have. <laughs> French version of it. Oh, uh, yeah, you're right. Well, spelling has never been my strength. In fact, yeah, anyway, <laughs> including people like Einstein. Well, Einstein, of course, never particularly liked quantum mechanics and was constantly trying to find reasons for getting rid of it. Now, let's remind ourselves a little bit about quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is a theory about the world. It's a generic theory which can describe all kinds of things that can happen in the world. And even if you specify the theory, you know, you tell how it develops from one time to the next, one still has to specify something around the, about the world in detail. What is the world like right now in order that I can use the equations of motion of quantum mechanics to say how the world is going to develop. And in quantum mechanics, the state, the world, while we naturally use the word term state, the state of the world is represented, and I'm going to represent it by little symbols that look like this, that are supposed to simply represent within the context of the theory, they have a certain mathematical form, they're vectors of the Hilbert space, blah, blah, blah. Don't really care about that. But one of the crucial features about these states is that you can add them together. 
So if you have two states of the world, and here I've just designated them by uh, psi and phi, then there exists other state, possible states of the world, which are sums of these. Uh, one of the features, since this thing ultimately represents probabilities, is that something called the inner product of this is supposed to be equal to 1. That just represents that something happens. And the probability of something happening is always equal to 1. Uh, but there always exists some other state, which is a linear combination, and in particular, a complex linear combination of these two states. And in particular, that there always exists some observable, something that you can measure, something that you can look at in the world at, at large, which for any linear combination of these two guys tells you that the probability of some value for that particular observable is equal to 1. So that if you believe the world is in that state, in one of these states, and you go to the world trying to make a measurement of some particular quantity, then the probability of finding a particular value for that quantity will always be equal to 1. This is a strange feature of quantum mechanics. It certainly doesn't exist in classical mechanics. If you have the possible state of a particle being here and a particle being over here, then of course saying, you know, it doesn't make any sense to say that somehow or other the particle is in a state which is the particle here plus the particle here. But in quantum mechanics, that's possible. And the kind of systems that we're going to look at are the very simplest systems. In this particular case, it's going to be an electron. And the only thing about the electron we're going to worry about is its spin. Electrons have this internal degree of freedom, some feature of the electron. It comes in two possible values, and it corresponds basically to the electron as though it were spinning like a top. And the direction is sort of like the axis along which that electron is rotating around the axis. And it can always, if you're trying to measure the spin of the electron, it can only You can have the top spinning this way, and if we're looking at how it's spinning in this direction, then it's maximally spinning in that direction. Or it could be spinning sideways, in which case its amount of spinning in that direction is zero. Or, you know, this way would be maximum down. You can get any possible value for the spin in any particular direction for a classical particle. But the crucial thing about these quantum mechanical particles is that it can only have two values. And in particular, these little arrows are supposed to represent the two possible values if you happen to be measuring the spin along this particular direction, the up and down direction. So this says it's got the maximum value up. It turns out to be 1 half times h bar, where h is the tiny little number, but we don't care about that. This has got its maximum value up. This is the one with the maximum value down. And those are the only two possible answers. One can have another state, which is the sum of these two guys. Well, what in the world do you mean? It's up and it's down. If we add them, what is that supposed to mean? Well, that turns out to be the electron with the maximum possible spin sideways. So if we add these two, two guys together, we get an electron with maximum spin sideways in one direction. If we subtract them, we get maximum spin in the other direction. Similarly, if instead of just adding and subtracting, we stick in complex numbers, we get maximum spin this way or this way. We're, in fact, never going to talk about these guys, just up and down and sideways or various directions in the plane. <coughs> so what this state means is that if one went to the electron and one asked it, how much are you spinning in this direction? it would say the probability of my spinning with the maximum amount pointing up is unity. The probability of spinning with the amount pointing down is zero. This electron, on the other hand, which is spinning sideways, if you went and asked it how much you're spinning up-down, you'd find that 50% of the time it was pointing up, 
50% of the time it was pointing down. And that 50%, I knew this microphone was going to cause problems. Don't worry about it. That 50% is one of the strangest features about quantum mechanics that bothered Einstein no end. And that, where does this probability come from? Now, one has the notion of probability in ordinary physics, but in ordinary physics, the notion of probability is there basically because of our ignorance. Right? If you take a dice and you throw the dice, you say, well, the chances of getting the six coming up is, is one in six, 16%. Why? Just say that. Well, I don't know what I'm doing when I'm shaking the dice. I'm throwing it, and it bounces around and does whatever it does. And surely there's nothing in the way in which I throw it which sort of biases me to one of those faces or the other. So each of the, each of the ways of coming up must have the same chance, and so each of them must be one-sixth. On the other hand, we sort of have the feeling that if I were the dice, well, of course, dices don't have consciousness. <laughs> dices don't have knowledge. But if I were the dice, I would really know which side of me is going to come up. Or to put it another way, that uh, if I really understood exactly how I was throwing it, if I understood exactly what kind of spin I gave it, how it tumbled through the air. I had all the laws of mechanics that told me how it tumbled through the air. Hit the table. I would now how bouncy the table. If I knew how bouncy the table was, I could calculate exactly which side would come up. So that in some sense, there is in the world sufficient information for me to get the knowledge of which side is going to come up. The problem in quantum mechanics is that's no longer true that when I say that this particle, this electron, whose spin is maximally sideways, I guess in that direction, uh, no, that direction, so this one, and I now ask how is it spinning in the up-down direction, I get 50% up and 50% of the time I come down, what does that 50% mean? Is there really something hidden in nature which, if only I knew it, I would be able to say, no, it's going to come up, just like the dice. Or is this probability somehow inherent within the, in nature? And as the development of quantum mechanics grew, it became clear that the answer was that this was an inherent feature. This means that in physics, there are aspects of physics which just happen. There's no reason for them to happen. They're happening without any sufficient reason. And they just happen to choose which of these up or down it is. It's not completely random because, as I said, it's 50-50. And saying 50-50 is, of course, more knowledge than saying, I have no idea what it's going to do. This is one of the big errors you often get, like in the extraterrestrial uh, chances of extraterrestrials being out there. I have no idea what's going to go on out there. Therefore, the probability, well, it must be at least 10%. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't that kind of thing. Here, one can accurately calculate the probabilities. And if you run the experiment a huge bunch of times, one will find that the frequencies of them coming up coincide with the probabilities. But still, which one comes up? There's no sufficient cause within the world which tells what comes up. And Einstein was very, very disturbed by this. See, I'm looking through these at a great rate. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll get to transmigration itself. Yes, we might. Yeah. Oh, is this falling down again? <laughs> I warned them of this. We'll clip it onto the pan. There we go. One of the other features of quantum mechanics is that there are these so-called non-commuting attributes. They're called non-commuting because when you multiply, if you do go through the formalism of quantum mechanics, 
it's such that if you multiply these two things together, it depends on which order you multiply them. Now, ordinary multiplication, of course, this is not true of. 2 times 3 is the same as 3 times 2. Okay? But in this case, you take these quantities. It's like parking, right? Uh, you have the operations of moving forward in parking or turning your car. And you know that as you move into a parking space, you keep altering though. You keep uh, uh, doing these uh, things. You turn, then you back up, then you undo the turn, you go forward, and you keep alterating, you know, going back and going forward with turning and not turning. And you know that they're non-commutative. In other words, they depend on the order in which you do them. If you turn your car to the right, and then you turn your car to the left, and then you move back, and then you move forward, you're not going to get your car parked. <laughs> You've got to turn, move, turn, other way, move the other way. And if you do that, you find, lo and behold, your car moves sideways very nicely, and eventually you get it parked. My record is having this much distance between the space between the two cars being that much longer than the length of my car. Uh, but that's an example of this non-commutativity. And it turned out that in quantum mechanics, this kind of operations become absolutely crucial to describing the world. And there are certain kinds of operators. In this case, for example, the uh, position and the momentum. The momentum is just the mass, how, head, uh, how big the particle is, times its velocity. These things don't commute. And as Heisenberg already showed in 1925, well, Heisenberg born in Jordan showed in 1925, that this then implies that there's an uncertainty between them. Since we've got this probability, if we go ahead and measure the position of the part, if you put the universe in some state, and we always put it in the same state, whatever that means, and we measure its position a whole bunch of times, and we ask how much is that position spread out? So sometimes you'll get the position here, sometimes here, sometimes here, and you'll get a spread, you know, about that big. Then you do the same with the same state, you measure the position, uh, the momentum. You do that a million times, you find out how much its spread is, you find out that the product of those spreads has always got to be bigger than this number, which is about 10 to the minus 34 uh, in appropriate units, a very, very small number. But for electrons, for example, that becomes very important. So you can never have certainty of position or momentum. You've always got to trade off one for the other. And this is true for any state of the system. Well, Einstein, not liking quantum mechanics, kept looking for places in which quantum mechanics were going to, was going to fall apart. And in 1930-something or other, uh, 35, thank you, Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen wrote a paper in which they tried to argue that quantum mechanics was incomplete. That there were situations in the physical world which were perfectly well described, which were perfectly physical situations, but weren't adequately described by quantum mechanics, and in particular the wave function of quantum mechanics. And in fact, what they wanted to do was to point out that you could have situations in which the momentum was very well defined and the position was very well defined. Now, as I said, Heisenberg and so forth had proven that whenever you have the system in some state, the momentum and the position always had to have this uncertainty to them. And that product of the uncertainties had to be bigger than h bar. And what they wanted to argue is that you could have situations in which you could have the momentum arbitrarily accurately defined and the position arbitrarily accurately defined so that their product wasn't equal to, wasn't greater than h bar, the product of the uncertainties wasn't greater than h bar, and therefore it couldn't be described by a wave function in quantum mechanics. Um, There seems to be a parallel talk going on here in the transparencies. <laughs> uh, uh, 
This is one of the reasons why I detest it when people cover up their transparencies. Because one can read transparencies much better than one can uh, listen to people. And so I just thought I would give you some extra reading material. Uh, <laughs> just in case you got bored with my voice. So they argue that if you can know the value of some attribute, let's say the momentum, with certainty or with arbitrary accuracy, without affecting the system at all, then there must be something about the system, some element of physical reality, as they called it, that corresponded to that. And the situation they set up was the following. Let's say that we have two particles flying apart from each other. Now, we're going to set the system up into a state such that the sum of the two positions is accurately known. Let's say 0. So let's say this is x equals 0. And we know that this position, it's got to be negative, plus this position is positive. They have to add up to 0. So we're going to know that really accurately. That says that we can't know the sum of the momenta very well at all. However, it turns out that the difference in the momenta I can know as accurately as I want. Because these two operators, in the formal language, these two operators commute. And there's nothing preventing you from knowing the value of two operators which commute, where it doesn't matter which order you do them in, with the accuracy that you want. So let's choose those two guys to be equal to 0 as well. Now they say, look, what we can do is we can go ahead and we, we're interested in this particle over here. But what we're going to do is we're going to go to this particle and measure its momentum very accurately. Of course, that will make its position completely uncertain, but I don't care what its position is. I'm just going to measure its momentum very accurately. But once I know its momentum very accurately, because I've stuck the particle into the state, I therefore know the other particle's momentum extremely accurately as well. Okay. Now I go to the other particle and I measure its position. Again, I don't care what I do to its momentum, but I'm going to measure its position very accurately so I know exactly where it is. Now, of course, during the process of that measurement, I could mess up its momentum. But before, the, the, that I, before, I, just before I measured that particle's position, I would know both of its momentum and since its position can't have changed that much, I will also know exactly what its position is. I.e., I know both the momentum and the position of that particle with arbitrary accuracy, which quantum mechanics says can't happen. And they give a potential answer in this famous paper. Uh, they give one possible way out of it, and they say, well, elements of reality have got to have to do with things that you're measuring only on the same particle at the same time. But then they give you this sort of, oh, this makes the reality of P and Q, this is the momentum and the position of that particle. They like to use Q instead of X. Depends on the process of measurement carried out on the first system, which doesn't affect the second system in any way. No reasonable definition of the reality could be expected to permit this. Why? Because this is basically a non-locality argument. That if I'm going to make the measurement on this, this particle affect the reality over here, then this particle could be over at Alpha Centauri. And how in the world could that particle affect something over here? Now, Bohr came up with an, a response to this. OK, so basically, there's no wave function, because a wave function always has delta x, delta p greater than h bar. Therefore, no wave function can represent the uh, condition of this particle number one. And therefore, quantum mechanics must be complete. Or they've got this little caveat that maybe it's non-local, even though they never use the term. Bohr came back and said, So 
Somebody mixed up my transparencies. Uh, it was one of the transmigrating souls. Yeah, it definitely is. <laughs> well, my momentum up here is so uncertain that I should know the position accurately. <laughs> Four came up with a response, and I keep reading that response and always come to the conclusion that either it's irrelevant or that actually Bohr goes in for the, the, exactly that option that EPR rejects. Mm, maybe I'll come back to that. Well, the next bit of the story, I mean, this is all somewhat fuzzy, and nobody's ever using the terms really non-locality and so forth. And the next person that came up was John Bell. Now, John Bell you know, sort of had the same kind of feelings that Einstein did. He was very, very uncomfortable with quantum mechanics and what quantum mechanics was saying about the world and that quantum mechanics had this probability in it which was somehow inherent in it. He asked another question in a slightly different way, and that is, can I think about the quantum world in a classical manner? Is there any way in which I can think about the quantum world in a classical manner? Or to put it another way, can classical mechanics ever mimic quantum mechanics? Now what are the key things that one has in quantum mechanics when one has these probabilities? And he said, or to put it another way, are classical correlations just as good as quantum correlations? Now, in classical mechanics, we all know that the correlations exist. They're usually, as we say, whenever we have probabilities in classical mechanics, those probabilities arise out of a lack of total knowledge of the system. But, for example, as I'm going to show a little bit later on, one could imagine an experiment in which one took thousands of $1 bills. We don't have many more. $5 bills just got more expensive. You tear them in half, stick them in envelopes, number each of the bills and number the envelopes, but don't say which one has the head and which one has the other one. And then you shift, ship them off. Well, you know that there's a very, very strong correlation. Envelope number 47, there are two envelopes 47. If in envelope 47, one of the envelope 47s, you get a head, you know the other envelope doesn't contain the head. Right? That's a correlation, or in this case, an anti-correlation. If one measures the headedness of the envelopes, one always finds that envelopes with the same number always have opposite headedness. One has a head, one doesn't. That's a classical correlation. In quantum mechanics, one can imagine looking, having two particles having these spins, and asking, OK, if this particle spin is pointing up, what direct, is this particle spin pointing up or pointing down? Is it maximally up or maximally down? And he said, let's take a state which is quantum mechanically perfectly correlated. Namely, we've got the spins pointing up in both particles. So these are supposed to represent two different particles, one of them off in Alpha Centauri or 10 to the 10th light years away, whichever you want. It takes a while to set up this experiment then. Uh, and one here on Earth. But I set these, this state up in such a way that the, both of them are pointing up. There's another possible way in which both of them are pointing down. And now what I do is, I, as I said at the beginning, I can always find a state which is the sum of those two. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the sum of those two. So that if I measure the, this particle, I'll get a 50-50 chance that I find it's pointing up. But whenever I find it's pointing up, I find the other one is also pointing up. Well, this state has the very, very nice property that it doesn't matter along which axis I do the experiment. So if I measure up and downness, 
I find this perfect correlation. If I measure this one, 50-50 up or down, but any time I find him up, I find the other guy up as well. Or in this direction, and I find the same thing, 50-50 this way or this way, but whenever this guy is this way, this guy is this way as well. And that's true for any arbitrary direction. Then uh, Bell said, OK, what I'm now going to do is I'm going to set up this state, this correlated state, this perfectly correlated state. But I'm not going to measure on the two particles whether both are pointing in the same direction. So for the first particle, I'm going to measure whether he's pointing up or down. Or I'm going to measure whether he's pointing side to side. OK? This way or this way. For the second particle, I'm going to measure whether it's 45 degrees or 45 degrees the other way. And I've put these little plus signs there to say that if he's pointing up, I'm going to call a plus 1. If it's pointing down, minus 1. If it's pointing to the right, I'm never sure how that translates onto here. If this one's pointing to the right, then that's plus 1. If it's pointing to the left, it's minus 1. If it's pointing up there, it's plus 1. If it's pointing, actually, I wanted that one down here for later use. Uh, it's, it's plus 1 down. It's plus 1 this way. That shouldn't be there. Now I'm going to carry out the following experiment. I'm going to set up millions of particles in this state. And now I'm going to start measuring. Over here on Earth, I'm going to measure the particles either up and down or side to side. And I'm just going to choose that randomly. What do I mean by randomly? Take any concept of random you want. I'm allowing you to change it to use whatever you want. Similarly, the guy over in Alpha Centauri, he's going to measure. Do his measurements. And we're now going to calculate what's called a correlation function. We're going, to me we're going to take this value here. Eventually, when the two experimentalists come back together and compare their values, I'm going to take the value he gets here and multiply it by the value he gets there whenever he measured C. So take those cases where he measured A and he measured C, and I multiply those two guys together. So if they, this guy got plus 1, and this guy got plus 1, then the answer is plus 1. If this guy got plus 1, this guy got minus 1, then the answer is minus 1. And I add them all together and average them. Then I also take those cases where you measured A and you measured D. The other guy measured D. And then I'll take all those cases where he measured B and C and B and D. Take all of those averages, and I take this particular sum of them. Why that particular sum? Well, Bell did that with malice of forethought. So here's the kind of experiment. Each of the guys goes ahead and makes his measurement. The first on the first set of particles, the first guy measures B, the second guy measures C. He gets plus 1 for B, minus 1 for C. I multiply those to get two together to get minus 1. And I look for all of the other cases where I had BC. Here again, we have BC that's minus plus. Here again, we have BC that's minus minus, which is plus 1. Here again, minus plus, which is minus. Add them all together average. I find that comes out to be minus a half. And I do this for all the four cases and add them together. Now this, you know. Why in the world does one do this? So we add them together, and we take that particular sum, well, uh, this particular sum on the previous transparency. Now, if we're doing classical physics, because of the fact that we were allowed to, we randomly chose over here, and we randomly chose over there, so nothing over here knew what we were going to choose over there. Nothing over there knew what we were going to choose over here. There's no way those two choices could influence things. There are correlations, but there's no way that deciding to measure B 
uh, um, A over here could influence the outcomes out there. We add these together, and we, from this randomness assumption, one can argue that that sum I had on the previous page can be rewritten in this way. In other words, it's as if you took the average on each particular trial of that combination. Now, you never actually measured all of those things on one trial. You had to measure each one of these guys on different trials. For example, in quantum mechanics, you know that your measurement of a spin in one direction alters the spin in the other direction. So you couldn't measure them both in one trial. But if we make the assumption that that average of that random average that we did up there is the same as if we had done the average of that expression for each trial, then you get the, this amazing result. I can rewrite this mathematically in this form. We can now argue that, well, A can have pl values plus or minus 1. B can have values plus or minus 1. So when I add A and B, I'm either going to get 2 if A and B are both plus 1, minus 2 if they're both minus 1, and 0 if they're opposite. Similarly, B minus A, well, that same thing. But furthermore, whenever A plus B is plus or minus 2, that means they both had the same sign, then this thing cancels out. So whenever this is plus or minus 2, this is 0. And whenever this is plus or minus 2, this is 0. So either one of these terms or the other dies out. C can only have values of plus or minus 1. D can only have values of plus or minus 1. So each of these guys, all they can be is plus or minus 2. When you average a whole bunch of things whose value is plus or minus 2, the average has to lie somewhere between those two. Right? If you've got a whole bunch of things, some of them are plus 2, some of them are minus 2, when you average them, you better get something that lies between plus and minus 2. So from very, very generic arguments, Bell argued that this average must be less than 2. We now go to quantum mechanics and ask what that average is. And the answer is 2.8. <laughs> plus 2.8. Twice the square root of 2. Square root of 2 is 1.41, whatever. Twice that is basically 2.8. Well, this seemed to be an incredibly general argument that Bell just went through. And you start wondering what in the world could have gone wrong. Well, of course, one of the assumptions he made was this locality assumption, namely that if I choose which experiment to do over here, it can't affect what happens over here. That's locality. Okay. The other part of the experiment is basically saying that, you know, the sum of these averages is just the average of the sum. Well, in fact, if you look at quantum mechanics, that's exactly true. So quantum mechanics certainly doesn't fall down on taking the sum of average being the average of the sum. What do we got left? Locality. So therefore, most people then say quantum mechanics must be non-local. And this is where the big problem has come in. So one used, the, one used this, non -local, this locality argument to argue that that averaging procedure, whether you took the averages of the individual terms and then added them together, or one added the terms together and then took the average, they should be equivalent. One used locality in arguing that for the classical system. For the quantum system, it comes out automatically. So the conclusion is quantum mechanics must be non-local. I told you what the end of the plot is already but the beginning. But.
One of the things that's not is that people very often confuse this with something that's in classical correlations already as well. Namely, they say, okay, we've got this correlation. You know, they're either both up or they're both down. I now go ahead and measure this guy and find that he's up. Because of the correlation, that means the other guy must be up. Therefore, this other guy, which before could be either up or down, is now with probability unity up. Therefore, there must have been some sort of funny influence which traveled from here over to here to make this guy suddenly be all up. Well, this happens in classical physics already. Because after all, in that dollar bill, that five dollar bill experiment, that's my drawing of Wilfrid Laurier up there. <laughs> and that's the parliament buildings over there. We shove these into the mailbox, and now there's a 50-50 probability that this guy, that Alice has the head and Bob has the tail, or, you know, other way around. Alice now tears open her envelope and finds the head, i.e. there must have been this weird non-local influence which traveled from Alice <laughs> to Bob to suddenly make Bob have 100% probability that he's got the, the parliament buildings. And well, of course, that's silly. So one of the ideas of non-locality in quantum mechanics gets confused with this kind of classical, even something that occurs even in a classical probabilistic system. <clears throat> so the initial correlation set up, the correlations set up initially are going to determine the future correlations. And that's true in qu classical physics just as it is in quantum physics. Of course, in classical physics, one gets around it by saying, no, but really, 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 those dollar bills knew that they were the head all the way along. So this probability was just sort of some funny calculus. So of course, that can travel non-locally or behave non-locally because it was just a fiction anyway. Well, let's go back to, to Bell's argument and look to see what happens with quantum mechanics. So as I said, quantum mechanics obeys, this is a very different ter, uh, meaning of commutativity. What I mean here is that whether we take the averages of those products first and then add them together, or take the sum of those things first and then average afterwards, this is like parking, you know, turning right or going straight ahead. Uh, whichever way we do that, we get the same answer in quantum mechanics. The products of operators don't, but this averaging certainly does. Do doesn't matter which way we do it. But what happens in quantum mechanics? <coughs> so remember that Bell's argument was that, look, A can have values plus or minus 1, B can have values plus or minus 1. Therefore, A plus B must have values plus 2, 0, or minus 2. Well, we ask quantum mechanics, what can, if A and B have the values plus and minus 1, what values do A plus B have? And the answer quantum mechanically is, it can only have values plus the square root of 2 or minus the square root of 2. It cannot have values plus 2, 0, and minus 2. Same thing is true of AB minus A. In fact, A plus B, if A is a measurement of the spin this direction, and B is a measurement of the spin this direction, then A plus B is a measurement of the spin in this direction, multiplied by the square root of 2. OK? And it can only have values plus or minus the square root of 2. Similarly, this guy can only have values plus or minus the square root of 2, not plus 2, 0, and minus 2. Furthermore, Bell's argument was that these are completely anti-correlated. Namely, that when this has value either plus or minus 2, then this must be 0. And similarly, when this has value plus or minus 2, then this must be 0. And again, quantum mechanically, that's simply false. These two quantities, these two attributes of the particle, 
in fact, correspond to measuring the spin in this direction, which turns out to be absolutely and completely correlated with this guy, because that's also the measurement in this direction of the other particle. And this corresponds to the measurement in this direction, and those two spin measurements don't commute with each other in quantum mechanics. They can't have actual accurate values both at the same time. Furthermore, this is completely correlated with this. Whenever this has value plus 1, this has value the square plus the square root of 2. Whenever this has value minus 1, this has value minus the square root of 2. Similarly with these two guys. And so what we see is that it's not non-locality that quantum mechanics violates, but is this naive assumption that if we have the sum of two quantities, then the values that that sum can take must be the sum of the values. The values of the sum must be the sum of the values. And in quantum mechanics, the sum of the values of a sum of attributes is not the same as the sum of the values. I.e., so, and these two guys turn out to be completely correlated. These are completely correlated. So this average, it turns out that this quantity is always equal to just plus the square, uh, twice the square root of 2, always. So this is just repeating what I said. And what we see there, therefore, is that quantum mechanics violates Bell's inequality, not because it violates some weird mystical notion of locality, that there's some non-local influence that goes from one to the other, but because quantum mechanics obey, violates this notion, a local notion, that the sum of two operators must have this, the values of a sum must be the same as the sum of the values. Well, that sort of tells you the story of why loads of people keep saying that quantum mechanics is non-local. One of the people who has done this most persistently is a guy by the name of Henry Stapp, who's at Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. He's a particle physicist. And throughout the last, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 years, do you know, Steve? It's been a long time, yeah. <laughs> has been arguing probably most vehemently that quantum mechanics is non-local. And he's actually come up with some very subtle arguments. And I want to go a little bit through one of them with you, because it's got some neat features. I don't expect you to get all of the details, but I hope that you get some of these neat features. So he bases this argument on a, on a situation that Lucy and Hardy found. So let's, let's do a little bit of logic. So we've got two particles, a rightmost particle I'll call R, and we've got two attributes of that particle. We can think about them as spins in various directions. And we've got a left part. Ah, <laughs> uh, well, as I tell my students, I'm dyslexic, so <laughs> there's hope for all of us. Uh, and now I'm going to tell you something. I, don't want, I want, won't go through the mathematics of this, but here, let us say that there exists a state for these particles. And the state is the following, has the following properties. If I measure A on particle R, and I find that its value is 1, so it's got two possible values, plus or minus 1, and I measure quality C on the left particle, I always find that its value is 1. So this doesn't say anything about what happens when I measure A on the right and I find its value minus 1. It's completely agnostic as far as that concerned. But every time I measure its value on the right, I find its value is plus 1. When I measure on the, the, on the particle on the left, I will always find that this attribute C has value plus 1. Furthermore, if when I measure the particle on the left, I find its value C is plus 1, and I measure the attribute B on the right, 
then I always find that its value is plus 1. So if A is plus 1, then B is plus 1. If B is, sorry, then C is plus 1. If C is plus 1, then B is always plus 1. If I measure B on the right, and I find its value is plus 1, then I always, 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 if I measure D on the left, I find its value is plus 1. Now the question comes, what conclusion can I draw if I measure A on the, I've gotten myself, on the right and find its value is plus 1? What can I say about D? Every time I measure A is plus 1, then, B is, uh, then C is plus 1. Every time C is plus 1, then B is plus 1. Every time B is plus 1, then D is plus 1. Therefore, every time A is plus 1, No, minus 1. Do A and B commute? No. <laughs> no, they clearly can't. But what you can show is that there exist states and there exist choices of these operators such that almost all of the time you measure and you find A is plus 1 and you measure D, you find its value is actually equal to minus 1. Not always. It turns out that you find this most often if the probability of finding A equals plus 1 is very, very small. So most of the particles have A equals minus 1. But the few times that A has plus 1, then you can go through this whole chain like this, or you can go directly from A to D, and you will almost always find that D is equal to minus 1 turns out that this probability that D is equal to minus, uh, that the probability here that D is equal to plus 1, if you call that epsilon, then the probability of actually finding A equals plus 1 turns out to be epsilon squared. is very small. For those of you in the know, the closer the state is to an unentangled state, is to a product state, the better this argument goes through. Unlike Bell's state, where the closer you are to an entangled, the fully entangled state, the worse it goes through. So Stapp's argument goes something like this. Uh, he wants to argue that this system is non-local. So he, his argument goes something like this. OK, let's imagine that these two people are situated such a way that they can't communicate with each other at all. Okay, so that they're far enough apart and the experiment is going to take a short enough time that there's not enough time for light to get from one to the other. There's no way they can communicate with each other. So let's say that this guy measured his particle and found that its value was equal to plus one. Okay. And this guy, we as God know, that this guy measured his quantity C and found that his value must, of course, have been plus 1. Because we said, every time A is plus 1, then C is plus 1. Now Stapp says, OK, but in the same situation, let's ex uh, um, imagine a counterfactual case. I said that A measured his value and found it was plus 1. But if in the course of this experiment, instead he had measured quality B. What must its answer have been? Well, from the fact that he got plus 1 for A, you know that this guy got plus 1 for C. Therefore, B, which we said was perfectly correlated with C in the cases in which C was plus 1, B's value must be plus 1. So if counterfactually he did measure A and find it to be plus 1, but if you imagine that instead he had measured C, and after all, this is completely causally disconnected from this, okay, so you know he could have decided, one can even make this so that this occurs later in time than this, he could have decided to measure B instead of A. Therefore, B must be plus 1. But now we can run this counterfactual argument one more step 
and imagine that C decides whether or not he's going to measure C or D. Since B had better, has got to be in this situation plus one, therefore D must be plus one. So therefore, in a situation in which we measure A equals one, one can go through this counterfactual argument and argue that D must be plus one. But any time you measure A and D, you, always, you almost always find it's minus one. So he argues there must be some non-local influence going on here. Uh, so that just says that. Well, what's the answer to this? Well, one popular answer is, wait, this uses all this junk called counterfactual reasoning. I mean, what is this? I did measure A, but what, I, what if I had measured something else but A? How in the world can we make arguments from what if I had done something else? And in fact, uh, Asher Perez wrote me a, a letter. Uh, he died recently. He was one of the great people in quantum information theory. And he will be sore missed. Uh, but anyway, before that, he wrote to me and told me a little parable. He said that when he was, when his mother, his mother had told him a story, that when she was very young, she had sat in the backyard one day, and she started worrying. She said, you know, my mother and father didn't, she realized her mother and father didn't have to marry each other. What if her father had measured, married somebody else and her mother had married somebody else? Whose child would she have been? Would she have been her father's child or would she have been her mother's child? And Asher says, she sat there and she worried about this for half a day. And then she finally decided that this kind of worries were just all nonsense anyway and forgot about it. And he told me this parable because he said, basically, he was telling me that this was also true in physics. That any time you're using this kind of, counter, kind of counterfactual argument, it must be complete nonsense. So you shouldn't do it. <laughs> but let's take another instance. Let's postulate a theory. Let's say that we believe in the transmigration of souls. Furthermore, in the context of our theory, transmigration is matrilineal. So transmigration tends to go through the mother. Furthermore, obviously the essence of a person is their soul. So therefore, if she had believed this, and she had started making that same worry, she would immediately have answered, of course, I would have been my mother's child. Because my soul would have gone down through the mother and the child of, and that soul is me and therefore I would have been my mother's child. Well this, this of course sounds a little silly but in fact there's an argument which is exactly the same as this using terms that we're a little bit more comfortable with and that is what if she had asked which of the children of her father or mother would have had her blue eyes? Well her father has blue eyes her mother has brown eyes. She knows genetically that blue is dominant. Therefore, obviously, she would have been her father's child. And I think almost nobody in the audience would say that there's anything wrong with this argument. And yet, logically, it's got the same kind of status as Asher Perez's mother. The problem with Asher Perez's mother is that she didn't have an adequate theory on which to base her counterfactual arguing. <laughs> so on any counterfactual argument, I, I believe counterfactual argument is valid. Uh, however, in this particular case, one has a great difficulty in deciding what that statement in the same situation means. And I think Stapp's argument hinges around that and ultimately fails. I just want to finish up going back to Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen and point out to you that, in fact, Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen were right. The wave function is inadequate to describe very many physical situations. But I'm going to do a slightly different experiment. 
This experiment is the following. I go into my lab at 9 o'clock one day, assuming I had a lab, and assuming <laughs> any of those who've seen my office, assuming I could find the electron. <laughs> and I measure my favorite electron. And I find its spin is up. And I go out, leave my door open, as I'm tending not to since somebody stole my laptop. Uh, but let's say I leave my door, uh, I thought this up when I used to still leave my door open. And then I come back at 11 and I go, I go to my favorite electron and I like measuring it, it's fun. And I measure its spin in this direction and I find it's plus one again. So it's pointing in this direction. And I sit down and I have lunch and I come back and one of my students comes in and says, oh, I came in at 10 o'clock this morning, I saw your door was open and I decided to measure your electron as well. And I measured it at some angle between that and that. What's the probability that I got the value plus one? And the answer is that the probability is unity that she got the answer of plus one had she measured it in the x direction. Because after all, I measured in the x direction here, and nothing has changed from here to here. So if she measured it in the same direction I did then, she must get exactly the same answer. And that's what quantum mechanics tells me. Had she measured it in the y direction, I can again go through the same argument to say that the answer must have been plus 1 in this direction. Because after all, when I measured it at 11 o'clock, it was plus 1 in that direction. Therefore, the probability of getting plus 1 for the spin in the x direction is 1, of plus 1 in the y direction is 1, but sx and sy, the spin in the x direction and the spin in the y direction, don't commute. They obey exactly the kind of uncertainty relationship that Heisenberg had for delta x and delta p. There's no wave function which allows the spin of the particle to have probability of 1 in the x direction and 1 in the y direction. This tells us there exists no wave function which can describe that experiment that she ran in the intermediate time. Does that mean that quantum mechanics is incomplete? It certainly says that the wave function is complete. It doesn't describe this experiment. Of course not. Because I used quantum mechanics to precisely determine that probability distribution for that spin in the intermediate direction. And you can go ahead and do those measurements and you find exactly those values. This kind of situation in which you place restrictions not only at the initial time, but you place restrictions both at the initial time and the final time has led to an extremely interesting problem that Aharonov and Weidman, again based on a different argument of Hardy's, have come up with recently. And they like phrasing it in terms of boxes. So instead of spin Sx being up or down, we've got this particle, and the particle is either in box A or is in box B. Similarly, the guy over in Alpha Centauri has the particle either in box A or box B. So box A is sort of equivalent to spin up, and box B is like spin down. Turns out, mathematically, you can map one problem onto the other. Now at 9 o'clock, well, this, if he's at Alpha Centauri, this had better be 9th century or something instead of 9 a.m. They prepare the system in this state. So the particle is either in state A of this guy and state B, uh, box B of the second guy, or is in box B of the first guy and box A of the second guy, or both particles are in box B. <coughs> i.e. they're never both in box A. Now at 10 o'clock, randomly, this guy or this guy or both look into their boxes, look into box A in particular, to try and decide whether the, box, the particle is in box A. So sometimes this guy doesn't look, sometimes this guy doesn't look, sometimes both of the guys look, Sometimes neither does. 
The ones in which neither do are going to be uninteresting, and when they get together at the end, we're going to throw them out. Then both people at 11 o'clock look to see whether the state is the particle being both in box A and box B. Remember, if, it, if it's possible to be in state A and possible to be in state B, then it's possible to be in the sum of those two states. So they ask, this is effectively equivalent to measuring the spin in the y direction. They ask, is it in A minus B? And if it's not, they throw that experiment away. Or is it, in, and this guy also asks, is in state A minus B? And if it's not, he throws the experiment away. So they only keep those experiments where both of them measured state A minus B. Now we ask, what's the probability that they find the particle in box A? The answer is surprising. If, both of, if only one of them looks at the box, so one of them looks, the other one doesn't. He always finds the particle in box A. Always. So if either the one guy on the left looks in his box, he will always find it in A. If the guy on the right looks in his box, he will always find it in box A. But remember that initial state said that it was never in both in boxes A. So whenever both of them look in their boxes, they never find them in box A. They're always both in box B. So whenever one of them, one or the other looks, it's always in box A. And whenever both look, it's never in box B. Sorry, it's never in box A. Is this non-locality? I'll leave you with that question to think about. Sessions. Sessions, yeah. And uh, so anyone who's interested, they'll certainly find the speaker there. Uh, and, um, he'll probably give you free parking lessons, uh, at least after he's had a few drinks. And, no, no, pool lessons. OK, pool. That's the same thing when you play both. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely non commutative. <laughs> Fuzzy on this bill, but I think haven't there been experiments on entanglement and the yes. to non-locality, and I thought they came up in favor of non-locality. No, so I mean this is this is this is precisely the problem I had with Bell. So there have been experiments which duplicate his Bell's theoretical structure. Okay, in his in that case they didn't look at the spin of electrons, but they set up two photons coming out from a, a particle decay. You choose a certain par kind of particle decay, and you find out then that the photon spins, the, the polarization of the photons coming out, is exactly correlated as, as mine were. And then they've done experiments on those photons, randomly choosing which direction to measure these guys, randomly choosing the two possible directions to measure this uh, polarization, and then calculating that average. And they find that that average is approximately twice the square root of 2. It's certainly bigger than 2, which is the so-called classical Bell effect. So yes, experiments have been done which, which satisfy Bell's inequality. The problem is that when they write them up, or when people talk about them, they then go and say, ah, what this shows is non-locality. What I demonstrated here is that the violation of Bell's inequality does not come about from non-locality. It comes about from this weird feature of quantum mechanics that if you add two things, the sum of those two things is not, the value of that sum is not the sum of the values. So A plus B can only have values of plus or minus square root of 2, not values of 2, 0, and minus 2. And furthermore, A plus B is not anti-correlated with A minus B. Okay? So that's what they've proven. 
and they've proven, what they've proven has got nothing to do with non-locality. They should know better, however. They keep writing their papers by saying that what they have shown is quantum mechanics is non-local. What they meant is that quantum mechanics violates Bell's inequality, and therefore, Bell, since Bell's in, everybody knows Bell's inequality means things are non-local, therefore it's violated non-locality. Uh, okay, but that's just a wrong statement. So the experiments are beautiful experiments. It's just the interpretation that stinks. Speaking as if this was well established, and there's a few guys that should know better. It's. <laughs> <laughs> is, this, is this a proper interpretation of your opinion? Or? It's well established by me. <laughs> is this, I mean, where is this being argued now? Where did one. Uh, where did one uh, <laughs> right, right here. Um, so what it is, is that if you, if, as we did, as we saw with Popescu, if you really nail them to the wall, okay, if you push them, Popescu will say, and he said, well, yeah, I mean, it's not really non-locality. But, you know, it's sort of a convenient way of talking about it. And almost all of them, if you push them, will say something like that. A few of them will then kind of go ahead, I mean, Stapp is an example for, you know, I've written papers, you know, arguing that Stapp's arguments are wrong. And he has, of course, come right back and told me I'm all wet <laughs> in print. Uh, so we've, I've got, uh, what's his, um, Shimoni, for example, who's another great old man of quantum information, quantum interpretation on my side as well. So there are, you know, a few people that are on my side if push comes to shove. Supposing you are not quite so naive realist, uh, who said, look, uh, take the space to go on page 16, you know, in which the sun will pop up and be down and down. Right. Um, and uh, the uh, not quite so naive realist would say, well, the only thing uh, you said is in other words, the only thing about these states is real in the sense that Einstein would be doing another not quite so many things. Is that the states that are that if one of them is not the other is up. In other words, you can't say uh, that one of the states is up. You can only say that they're both up, that they're both the same. Okay? And uh, in other words, you can say something about the relative state, not about the individual state. They're correlated. Yeah. Um, and then another not quite so many take the superpositions of all possibilities after that. That's essentially, in the, the let's say the pathological formulation of quantum sure. mechanics, what you have to do. Fine. Now, that makes it non-local, because you've got more than one path that you have to take, and they're not all doing the same thing, but some of them are going different if, places. If what, essentially, I would say, what Einstein is um, I don't think so, but... Uh, I, you know, I can give a small lecture on um, path integrals. <laughs> <laughs> I got some of my. <laughs> I got some of my uh, my particle physics colleagues very annoyed once at a conference in Durham, where I stated that I felt that Feynman's path integral formulation had in fact set back the field of particle physics by 20 years. Um, and the reason is because once, I mean, what Feynman's path integral formulation was an extremely neat mathematical way of encapsulating certain calculations that you have to do. The content of those paths is not in the paths, it's in those calculations. 
So each of those lines represents a Green's function, and each of the vertices represents products of Green's functions at points that you have to integrate over. And those paths do not correspond in any sense to physical reality. They correspond to only these kinds of integrals that you have to do. And because, and because it's so closely tied to perturbation theory, particle physicists felt that perturbation theory was the be-all and end-all, and were very surprised in the 1980s when nonlinear effects, solitons, etc., came up, which they should have been able to recognize already in 1930. But that's a, side, that's a side issue. But in the course of that, I've sort of answered you. I don't believe that those paths in the path integral have anything to do with, uh, with reality. But the not quite so naive realist would say, yes, they do. They are reality. Well, fine. I mean, you can certainly go ahead and, and choose a philosophical stance in which you argue yourself into believing that quantum mechanics is non-local. And as is always the case, it is very difficult for somebody who doesn't uh, to change the mind of somebody who has convinced themselves. The argument. What is your demonstration that that, that, that is wrong, that they're, that they're not real? I mean, this is consistent with everything we know about quantum mechanics, and, uh, as you say. No, it's adding, it's adding a whole extra layer of baggage. This whole, all of these paths that you're adding in there are not something that occur within quantum mechanics. They're an ex extra layer that you've added on top of it, which, in fact, plays no role within the quantum mechanics as well, and then you say that this extra baggage somehow corresponds to the realism. It's very similar to the uh, Bell's, um, it's not, well, Bell and Bohm's um, um, hidden variable theory, which is certainly a non-local theory. I agree. And, and Bohm's, you know, hidden variable theory, it has the wave function acts as sort of a guider the real things are these little particles. The wave function acts as a sort of guiding field which tells these particles what their velocity should be at any instant. And that wave function is a non-local wave function. So what they've managed to do is to convert quantum mechanics into a genuine non-local classical theory, certainly. And if that's what you do, then you have a non-local classical theory. I admit that. The question is whether or not one has to accept that quantum mechanics itself, not all of this additional baggage that one is placing on top of quantum mechanics, whether quantum mechanics itself is a non-local theory or not. But all that the path integral is saying is exactly what you said, which is that any intermediate time, I can make any quantum state I want to by summing the ones that I started with. I can take an up and a down, and I can sum them to get Yes. Right or left, and that's the different paths, the different possibilities you can get by summing. That's all. I mean, it's, it's a it's a it's a picture which is describing what you said. Uh, no, well, I disagree. I think it's adding additional baggage onto what I said. Bill, your dollar bill is actually not two states. Right? It's only one state. That you kind of split well, the, no, the, the dollar bill, the state is, is whether the dollar bill was in the envelope that I sent off to you or the, yeah, the half that I sent off to him. It's one, it's one object, but that object can be in two possible states, namely the envelope with the head going to you and the tail going to Philip, or the state of the head going to Philip and the tail going to you. So those are the two states. This is not, it's really kind of like one object described by two different states. And then when you do the, the quantum mechanics on it, then it, add, it adds up that way. So it's not really like two different objects. Be because they, they, when you talk about non-locality, is you have two different objects right. which are somehow right. communicating to each other. Sorry, I guess I should have, I, I just realized I got myself into, dug myself into a hole. The, the, <laughs> The, 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 the objects are the two halves of the dollar bill. And the states are, you know, whether they're heads or um, parliament buildings. So they're not really two objects. It's one object. No, when you've torn it in half, you've got the two halves, which are the two objects that you're sending to the two different people. So those two, each half is an object in its own right. And it's got the possible states of being the head or the parliament buildings. 
are the states of each one. And in this case, they're anti-correlated, namely of that if you get the head, he gets the parliament buildings, and if you get the parliament, he gets the head. We have a question over here. Excuse me, but your argument against the path integral approach would cut also in case of a variational approach to classical mechanics. Uh, uh, then it would be logical to argue that uh, all variational principles uh, uh, don't have any physical reality behind them. Because these right, and we know, I'm, and I don't think anybody in classical mechanics believes that uh, that this variation, where I say, you know, I throw this thing into the air, and there's a variation of it where it went out the window through the door, you know, visited the physics building and came back here. That's a possible variation. Does that variation have physical reality? No. Just came the <laughs> <laughs> It was quick. <laughs> So the answer is, yeah, in classical physics, the only, the only thing that has physical reality is that single path, which is the maximum of the variation. And the other is there just purely as a calculational tool in order to get that, that reality, in order to describe that reality. And similarly here, only in a different sense. Uh, yeah. About what you mean when you say non-local, because <laughs> I, I think what you're, I think what you're saying was that there's no I, I, I told no 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 no. So I, I told you right at the beginning that to some extent this is all silly, because everybody agrees that quantum mechanics is local in the sense that if I do something over here, the amount of time it takes for that whatever I do over here to get over here is limited by the speed of light. Okay, and that every, you know, the dynamics of quantum mechanics, of quantum field theory, etc., all tells me that all influences are limited by the light cone, by the speed of light. So therefore, there is nothing that I can do over here, or the way in which we usually phrase it, there's no way in which I can use what I do over here to signal something going on over there. So there, that, that's, that's indisputable, okay? Nobody, almost nobody... <laughs> So in his, in his sense, yes, there's agreement on that one. You know, there may be a few people that don't, but there's agreement on that one. So the, the sense in which it's a, it, it's, a much more, it's a much more subtle sense of what you mean when you say that quantum mechanics is non-local. And that's part of the difficulty, okay, in, in explicating that subtle sense is that these people feel very strongly, some of them, Stapp, for example, feels extremely strongly that quantum mechanics is non-local in some sense. Okay, but refining that sense to say exactly the sense in which it is non-local becomes difficult. Not the sense in, you know, do something over here and it affects you there. You know, I do a little, put pins in my voodoo doll over here and a big hammer you on the head over there. You know, even if you're off in Alpha Centauri, that's not the sense in which anybody means it. And so explicating exactly what's meant by non-locality is one of the difficulties that one has in trying to make this more definite. And is, of course, one of the difficulties in attacking because, you know, if you leave your terms really vague, then whenever it, when somebody attacks you, you can tell them they didn't really understand you. <laughs> Yeah. So what's the answer to your last slide question? I, I, I got to leave that to the uh, audience to uh, decide. The, it's an interesting experiment, and one of the things that they emphasize is that this is, an, in this case, all of the observables, you know, whether you're in a box A or box B, or you measure the boxes of either of these two guys, are commuting. So all of the observations that the people make are actually commuting observations. They're not, there's not a non-commutativity going on there. That's not quite accurate because that final condition doesn't commute with that intermediate measurement. So when you ask that the state of the boxes at the end be, you know, in box A minus being in box B, that state measuring of, or putting that final condition is a non-commuting observable with being in box A or being in box B. So there is non-commutativity that goes on. 
But the bare statement of the problem is a statement in which you're actually looking at commuting observables and finding these weird, you know, it's always in box A except when both of them look and then it's never in box A. Uh, anyway, so, you know, because of this the setting the final conditions, it, the whole, you know, whether that's non-local or not becomes a much more difficult question. Figuring out exactly what you mean by saying that that system is non-local becomes much more difficult than it is even in, for example, the Bell experiment. Yeah. Um, so my question will be the last one. Uh, just uh, why you ask me to bring this laser pointer? <laughs> 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 the point of you, buddy. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so my question is I will evade that one just as I evaded the other questions. <laughs> I was wondering how the locality relates to this, the rolling of the die. Well, the, the rolling of the die was, was really there only in order to tell, to sort of indicate this probabilistic nature of quantum mechanics and also to contrast the probabilistic nature of quantum mechanics with the probabilistic nature of classical mechanics that in classical mechanics one believes that the die really knows what its value is, even if we don't. And so the probability becomes one of ignorance, but the world knows. I don't know what the world knows really means, because the world doesn't have, you know, dies don't have knowledge, they don't have consciousness, and so forth. Um, to contrast that in quantum mechanics, where nobody but one, where most people don't, most people with conventional interpretations of quantum mechanics, I'm going to uh, limit my statement so much that it defines it out of existence, but uh, <laughs> uh, nobody who believes in the classical interpretation of quantum mechanics believes that there is anything in nature which tells you what the probabilities are that produce quantum mechanics, that produce the probabilities in quantum mechanics. So nature itself doesn't know, you know, the electron itself doesn't know whether its spin is going to be up or down. And in a sense, Bell's argument is precisely that it doesn't know. That if it did know, that then one could go through Bell's argument as he presented it and get the fact that these correlations should come out to be less than one, no less than two, you know, between minus two and plus two. Uh, on the other hand, you find it's bigger than that which is really a statement, again, that in quantum mechanics, the system itself doesn't even know what its values are going to be until the measurement takes place. I guess one more question. So, you could put fully spin half particles in this P0 state, right? One in half and one in half. Right. If, you, if someone measures here, this is going to be up, and then the other guy must, at that moment, Whatever you choose to be there on the table, you must get it down, right? This is what I understand by this normal thing. Well, no, it's not normal. It's, it, but that's just a statement about correlations, OK? That's the dollar bills, right? Whenever he opens his envelope and finds his dollar bill as the head of Laurier, then he opens his envelope instantly, and it's the, it's the parliament buildings, OK? Is that non-locality? <laughs> now there you get around it by this additional hypothesis that the dollar bill always knew what it was. So that, you know, there's nothing about the objective world that actually changed when you opened the envelope. And therefore, it's not open. But I think even if you believe that in classical physics one had true probabilities, that the dollar bill didn't know until that time, even then, you wouldn't call it, I don't think you would call this correlation. The correlation was set up by that initial experiment, you know, when I tore them in half and stuck them in the envelope. That determined the correlation. And similarly, in quantum mechanics, that determines the correlation. But people are right? There are 50 chance of getting up and down. Right. But before he opens the envelope, 50 50 chance of getting the dollar bill up, uh, get her. Right, but whenever I measure it and find something, at that moment I'm fixing the other guy's mistake. 
Yeah, that's because they're correlated with each other. You're not doing anything to the other guy. Do something to the other guy. I'm going to fall over. Maybe other people will too. He's just come back from a fog bank in New Zealand. So. Um, so you brain, guys think the boss, probably the yeah. brain got left there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, no, 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 no. Oh, he brought the fog back. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I just want to say two things before we close up. Um, one is that um, that the the uh, lecture in a month from now uh, will be by Charles Bennett, who I guess if anyone could be the inventor of the idea of quantum communication, uh, it has to be him. Uh, this is of course uh, making all sorts of other things like quantum cryptography and uh, the, um, not so much press of interest for certain quasi-governmental organizations in the U.S. in, this, in quantum mechanics. Um, the uh, is, uh, you should you know, store up a simple question to ask him after five minutes because that would start with kind of jokes. And, uh, very, very, very amusing, actually. Um, so it's definitely worth coming just if you want to have a good laugh. He's actually a remarkably uh, interesting speaker. Now, I have a question. How many people, this is a good cross-section of uh, the audience, would not come to a talk uh, in April because of exams? The second Wednesday night. The probability of each of you is 100% that you <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so that's interesting because the speaker that was going to come in April cancelled. So the question was whether we put somebody else on up. Let's just think about that. Um, well, it'll, it'll be announced on the web page, whatever happens. Um, in May, uh, we have um, Gerard Tolt from the Netherlands who, who won the Nobel Prize in 99. I'm sure that you would absolutely disagree with everything that we're saying. I'm absolutely sure of it, in fact, 100%. <laughs> uh, and then I should point out that he will actually be the opening speaker in a five day conference uh, here held by the ITP, in which there will be a number of public talks by people like Paul, for example, who's sold about 10 million books on um, popular discussions of science, God, quantum biology. Uh, 